Welcome, YouTube. This is Global Studies 9, Korea International School, Jeju. So, um, we're looking at ancient world history, patterns of interaction, and um, I'm basically going through different chapters, different sections. This is primarily actually for next school year, but I want to finish off this school year by trying this, um, so what we call flipped classroom for a few classes and see how it goes. So we're starting off with chapter 22, section 1A. But before we dive into the scientific revolution, we have to look at what we've looked at the past quarter. So what is this stage? What are we looking at? Well, we've looked at the Reformation, the Renaissance, and we're noticing this big change in Europe, right? People are beginning to explore outside of Europe. Scholars are beginning to question big ideas that have been accepted for hundreds of years. So we're beginning to see big, big changes at all different levels happening between 1300 to 1600s. Now, um, prior to the scientific revolution, the main source of information came from the Bible. And this was not a great place to look for when you're looking for scientific information. In fact, it's just full of misinformation everywhere. So some specific examples. We have, for example, trying to cure the plague with prayer as we know, does not work. Another is saying that the Earth is the center of our solar system and that everyone else or all other planets revolve around us. This concept of geocentrism that the church preached is simply incorrect. And finally, we have the church advocating for numerous religious wars where over a million people have died for, um, which is just simply not a way to live your life. Now, um, how bad were things during these Middle Ages? Well, just to give you an anecdote, there was once this, perfect, uh, this philosopher, this scholar called Hypatia. Her father was a professor, and in one of her writings, she said something that was slightly anti-Christian. And as a result, a mob came and they killed her in the middle of daylight. And none of the mob had any uh, persecutions or any punishments. This gave you an idea of just how much threat uh, scientists were getting throughout the Middle Ages if they questioned anything about the church. But now that we reach the Renaissance and the Reformation, things are beginning to change. Right, first of all, information is spreading a lot more faster with the printing press invented by Johannes Gutenberg. Through travel, Europeans are beginning to get access to new information they never had before, new inventions they never had before, the astrolabe from the Arab world, the magnetic compass from China, right? They're beginning to find out that, that these, all these the, uh, various mathematical concepts, algebra, algebraic concepts from the Arab world as well as to a certain extent India. So we're getting major progress just by also um, taking in and consuming information from other societies. So scientific revolution was a new way of thinking about the natural world. That way it was based upon careful observation. That's key there, observation. And the other key thing is to question already accepted beliefs and see if they're true. And if they're not true, then what is true? So we're going to look at a few key characters. So starting off with Copernicus, who looked at the stars and the earth and how they revolved, and he noticed that they revolved around the sun, not the earth. Now Copernicus was a smart guy, and he knew this concept of heliocentrism, not geocentrism, would be something the church would not be very happy about. So instead of publishing it right away, he waits until 1543, his last year of his life, and he publishes this information, so the church does not have any time to prosecute him. Now, following Copernicus, um, this becomes a fundamental for various scientists when it comes to studying our galaxy, our universe. And we have Brock, who records the movement of the planets, and following his recordings, we have Johannes Kepler, who then uses this data and through mathematical laws and different calculations, he's able to figure out the exact planetary motions. And so the last piece of this puzzle is Galileo Galilei. I see a little silhouette of a man. Galileo Galileo. 
So Galileo uh, built his own telescope and he was able to figure out that Jupiter had four moons and the sun had dark spots. So this shattered Aristotle's theory previously, which said that the moons and the stars were all these perfect substances. Not only that, but he, like Copernicus, believed that the sun was the center of the, of the solar system. And um, he was a bit apprehensive, though, about supporting Copernicus, because like Copernicus, he knew the church would not like this idea. And unfortunately, his suspicions would become truth when the Catholic Church would summon him and make him stand trial in 19, sorry, in 1633 and uh, forcing him to confess that Copernican ideas are false. And uh, for the remainder of his life, Galileo was under house arrest and never a free man until the end of his life in 1642. Now, an interesting fact around this is that things change a bit in the 1900s. Right? We know more information. And as a result, the Catholic Church in 1992 officially acknowledged that Galileo had been right, and they apologize. And this um, article here states, after 350 years, Vatican says Galileo was right. In fact, it moves, and here it being the pronoun, obviously, for the earth. And a little bit of wordplay, because that's what Galileo famously said, is that, uh, you know, despite what the church says, it still moves, right? The earth still moves. Now, the scientific method is um, a revolution in the scientific thinking that the approach to science can be based upon research, hypothesis, and experiment, right? It's not about just basing your thoughts, your ideas, your findings on authority from the past, right? It's not all about being able to experiment and be able to question ideas, and more important to you, well, to experiment again if you, you know your hypothesis is not true. So the key thing is ask questions, and uh, those questions hopefully develop into hypothesis, and then be able to test and experiment those various questions you have. Now here's an example of the scientific method. Now, this is way too long to read in detail, so I'm just going to give you the summary version. So the summary version is, I have raspberries and I want to see how the raspberries grow. So what I'll do is my hypothesis is raspberries that receive more water will grow bigger. And so in that case, I have two sets of raspberries. One that receives two cups a day and one that receives one cup a day. And then after watering these raspberries for, let's say, a month, I see how they've changed in size. And if my hypothesis is correct, the one with more water has grown larger than the ones that receive less water. And of course, if I notice that they're the same size, or in fact, the ones with less water has grown, my hypothesis is in that case incorrect. And I go back to the drawing board. I maybe figure out, you know, what was the deal? Maybe I overwatered them. Maybe I underwater them. Maybe I should have more samples. And the key word here is experiment, experiment, experiment. Okay, so moving on to Francis Bacon. So um, he urged scientists to experiment and then draw conclusions. Right? He was all about using various experiments, especially those that relied on empiricism. So what uh, empiricism is, is when one relies on their five senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. And... Um, he believes that all knowledge is re of reality is derived from your senses and that everyone is born with a blank slate. Interestingly enough, a few centuries later, a certain man named John Locke would have a very similar theory. So again, five senses there, touch, sight, taste, smell, and um, what you hear. So then uh, moving on to uh, Descartes. I know it looks like Descartes, but it's actually Descartes. So Descartes uh, believed that everything should be doubted until proven by re with reason. So rather than using experimentation, which uh, was advocated strongly by Bacon, he relied more on mathematics and logic. And perhaps its most famous words were, I think, therefore, I am. And he claimed that the only certainty of that he had was his own existence. Everything else... You know, even if he saw something right in front of him, let's say he saw a horse right in front of him, 
he believed that, um, you know, perhaps it might not be a horse, you know, what is a horse? It, it, you know, maybe he's in a dream, right? That he knew that the perceptions of people could be easily fooled, right? And an example uh, I could give you that Descartes would perhaps agree with would be, for example, I close my eyes and I smell in front of me delicious curry. So my senses are telling me that there's curry right in front of me. And I'm pretty excited, man. I'm hungry, you know, and I'm, I'm ready to eat. But then I open my eyes and all I see is a piece of paper. And I realize someone had sprayed on that piece of paper this fiery curry um, clone. By this is real. If you want to pick up some uh, fiery curry clone, it is available on Amazon. And uh, therefore my senses have tricked me. Right? I, I, because I smelt what I thought was curry, I thought there was curry in front of me, but in fact there isn't. So interesting thing to think about. I know this kind of you know, gets into the realm of philosophy, but you know this, this all overlaps. Social sciences, physical sciences, philosophy. Right? At the end of the day, they all fall under the category of history. Now, uh, moving on to Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton's greatest discovery was that the same force ruled motion of the planets and all matter on Earth and in space. And perhaps most famous are his three laws of motion, uh, something you would definitely cover in a physics class. So um, I am not great at science, as well as math. Actually, a lot of things, uh, but uh, science being one of them. So I'm not going to go over these um, laws in much detail. Um, you just have to know the basics of them. So the first has to do with inertia. Um, this has to do with the fact that an object is at rest and will stay at rest until a force acts upon it, and that an object that is in motion will not change its velocity unless a force acts upon it. So something is in motion, it just continues to go on motion until something um, acts upon it. The second law of motion is acceleration is produced when a force acts on a mass. The greater the mass, so the bigger, heavier thing is, the more force you need to move it. So that's pretty straightforward, right? It's easier for me to push a bicycle than for me to push a truck, right? I need more velocity to push that truck that has more mass. And finally, the third but not least law of motion is that for every force, there is a reaction of force that equals in size. So just imagine someone pushing off a skateboard, right? I'm pushing one way, and as a result, I'm able to accelerate the other. So Newton was a major proponent of this concept known as deism. Uh, this should be reviewed from quarter one, where he believed that God did create the universe and Earth. But once he created Earth, he left, and everything that happened on Earth was not really God's will. It was just Earth running its own course. And um, a common uh, metaphor many historians use for this concept of deism, you know, something uh, famous people like Thomas Jefferson and Ben Franklin also believed in, is that like someone would make a clock, and once they make the clock, they just let the clock run. And, you know, the clock might break, the clock might change in time a little bit, etc. It's the same thing with Earth. Earth was created by God, and once it was created, it just was running like a clock. And um, you know, some good things happened, some bad things happened, but none of it was God's will. Now, uh, moving on to the last few pages here, we've got um, the overview of old science versus new science. So, old science is about relying on ancient authority. Right, it's about relying on the church. Now, new science is a lot more about observation, experimentation. It's about using scientific reasoning to gather knowledge and draw conclusions. Right? So the key thing here is experimentation. You're experimenting, experimenting, and through experimenting and creating hypotheses and finding evidence, that's how you draw upon your conclusions. So a big change from authority and church now towards experiment and reasoning. So just a few um, examples of, ex of inventions from this time period to finish off. We first have the microscope, uh, developed by Johnson in 1590. And um, obviously it's a very important invention that's still used today. I'm sure you used them in your own high school science labs. We also have the barometer, which helps us me measure the atmospheric pressure as well as the weather. 
And um, interesting fact about the barometer is that in 2007 in Europe, as well as I believe the late 90s, maybe early 2000s in the U.S., um, the mercury barometer started to get banned. And the reason was because mercury could be harmful to human beings. So today, um, if you ever see something measuring a temperature, it's probably not using mercury uh, because it's banned in many places around the world. Uh, later on, different scientists build upon the barometer. So, for example, we have Fahrenheit in the 1700s, figuring out you know what the boiling point is and what the melting point is. So he, he calls 32 the melting point and the boiling point at, thir at 212. Uh, later on, Swedish astronomer Celsius creates another scale, um, in my opinion, far superior, a far more simple scale where the melting point is zero, or the freezing point is a zero, and the boiling point is a hundred. Now, in an ideal world, we would just use Celsius. Uh, but the United States of America, big country, 350 million people, and, you know, very much influential, uh, still uses Fahrenheit, which is why we still do need to know Fahrenheit being global citizens. So um, the equation to change Celsius to Fahrenheit, you can see that on the left top there, it's not the easiest, right? It's not like changing pounds to kilograms or centimeters to inches. Um, so what I do is I just memorize key um, Celsius to Fahrenheit, like that freezing for Celsius is zero, for Fahrenheit it's 32, uh, for Celsius room temperature is 20, while Fahrenheit is about 70, and then um, very hot weather, so 35 for Celsius is about 95 for Fahrenheit. So um, if you are like me and too lazy to always convert the two, just memorize you know the major differences. You know, so Fahrenheit 95 is very hot. 70s room temperature, you know, 50, 40 is starting to get cold, and 32 is freezing, and so on. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976 allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, blah, 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 blah. no copyright infringement is intended. Uh, have an excellent day. Goodbye.